want to welcome everyone back to the Picanones show. Returning, Pedro Gonzalez. How are you doing, Pedro? I'm well. How are you? Doing very well. Good. All right. We are here to read and comment on Chapter 9 of Nima Parvini's The Populist Delusion. And this one is called The Therapeutic State. And it goes over the writings of Paul Gottfried. And you are an editor at Chronicles. I believe that Paul is the senior editor at Chronicles. Um why is Paul special to you? I think he's he's like the most underrated living scholar of our time who really understands the issues in a way that other people don't. Paul's level of learning is unusual. Um, it, you certainly don't see it on the mainstream right, someone who's, who's actually an intellectual in the true sense. And uh, I think his, um, his, his ability to entertain... Um, an actually d diverse array of ideas and thinkers, even those that are considered controversial, like Carl Schmitt, and then apply what he learns in a way that's that's relevant. You know, even ten day, uh, ten years after the fact. Um, in this case, we're going to be talking about after liberalism and managerialism and the politics of guilt. These are not new books. These are, these are books written, you know, a decade or so ago, and uh, the the insights from them are still uh, as relevant or more relevant than ever, actually. So. Paul is uh, an unusual luminary, I think, in a good way. Well spoken. Well spoken. I've had him on to talk about um, fascism and anti-fascism, and I've had him on to talk about stress and the neocons. So, yes. yeah, it's um, amazing. Amazing what he knows. Yep. All right. So just like all the rest of the chapters, I'm going to read. I'm going to share screen, put this up there, and you stop any time that you feel like you need to comment, and um, I'll do the same. Okay, sounds good. All righty. Boom. All right. Chapter 9, The Therapeutic State. In theory, the role of government is not for the sake of its own power, but for the benefit of the people it is supposed to serve. If a government does not serve the people, then it must be transformed until it does, it does so or be overthrown and replaced with one which does. However, in Multiculturalism and the Politics of Guilt, published in 2002, Paul Gottfried argued that the modern managerial regime had com completely inverted this theoretical relationship. Rather than transforming itself to serve the people, the managerial regime seeks to transform people in the service of its system of, atom of atomized corporate consumerism. I think you, you already see here a kind of radical break between Paul and mainstream conservative commentary on this, right? Um, in the sense that Paul understands that we no longer live in a constitutional republic. And if you get your takes from your typical conservative pundit, uh, they're arguing that either we still do, but it's endangered, um, or that we, you know, like Mark Levin or something like that, right? Like, you know, this is, this is against our constitution or something like that. Um, it, it, like you already see that Paul, Paul already begins from like, you know, 10 steps down the road where he's saying, uh, our, our regime is fundamentally different, um, from, from what, what it was initially conceived as, uh, it, it no longer actually serves anything that, that's like a social good, and instead it exists to transform people, to to engineer a, a specific type of subject. So you, like, just in the first you know few lines, you already see why Paul is um, why he, why his insights are so radically different again from your average conservative who either thinks that we do live in a constitutional republic, and therefore, you know. Uh, it's not okay for the FBI to raid Mar-a-Lago because that, that's somehow that's a violation of constitutional rights, which is in theory true, but in reality irrelevant besides the fact, right? Or the people that think that, you know, uh, we, we need to vote in the next election in order to save the constitutional republic that's endangered. Paul is saying it's dead and gone. So Yeah. yeah. And also he's crushing anybody's hopes of, oh, we still have a free market things like that. Yeah, it's just, that's right. That's, I mean, that's, yeah. that's again, uh, the, the, you don't hear this from the, uh, the typical conservative, the idea that basically, um, that, that there's something bad about capitalism, that there's something bad about our, our culture of consumerism. Um, so. Yep. All right. It drives ever more closely towards what Juvenal saw as the final destination, 
It ends in the disappearance of every constraint which does not emanate from the state and in the denial of every preeminence which is not approved by the state. In a word, it ends in the atomization of society and in the rupture of every private tie linking man and man, whose only bond is now the common bondage to the state. The extremes of individualism and socialism meet. That was their predestined course. Yeah. However, yeah, we got. <laughs> no, I, I think um, I, I actually just wrote a piece about neoconservatism, and this is something. This is something that I I, I kind of touch on, but from a, a different direction, and basically like the um, the 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 new neocons uh, like like Barry Weiss and Douglas Murray. Um, who conceive of themselves as kind of breaking with, with the left, they, they, they kind of see themselves as good liberals, right? And in many cases, that's what a lot of conservatives see themselves as, uh, that, that the true conservative is actually trying to preserve the liberal order, the, the proper liberal order, right? Um, and like the average Barry Weiss reader, like Barry Weiss herself, uh, there, there, was, there was an article recently to give you a concrete example about like the problems with Hollywood. And in this article, it talks about how, like, in the past, uh, there was this kind of noble crusade to root out white racism in Hollywood, uh, to break the what, what the author called the white wall. But then Trump gets elected and a mass hysteria descends upon Hollywood and then everything is bad. And basically, there's no sense of maybe these things are connected. Maybe our, our crusading for social uh, justice and individual individualism at the same time was a kind of contradiction. And, and the comments are like that too. The comments are like, I was always, you know, like as someone who's worked in, in the entertainment industry, I was always opposed to racism, but you know, this stuff just goes too far. And um, I talk about this in my piece because it, it's something that James Burnham mentioned too, that basically this tension between individual freedom uh, uh the the ability to kind of you know live whatever life you want and social justice are at odds uh because social justice requires uniformity like we we have to get people to act a certain way uh on the on the basis that certain behaviors are discriminatory and it, uh they exclude others right or they stigmatize others and so that means that there's not really a whole lot of room for individualism if you believe in social justice, because individual thinking, individual types of behavior can be thre uh, can threaten, let's call them so certain sacred groups, right? Whether they're minorities or people that are transgender or whatever. And th the point that uh, everyone from Paul to Burnham to Juvenal has has made is that that ultimately this this kind of like what we're seeing now, it's not like oh it's liberalism abandoned and betrayed. It's like no, this is the logical conclusion of these two tensions resolving themselves. Uh, and I mean, the, the other people go back further to Rousseau. Uh, that the, 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 we're living, what we're living in right now is a, is a kind of Rousseauian totalitarianism, where where um, any kind of dissidence is unacceptable and it has to be crushed. So, in other words, liberalism and leftism, they're, it's not like they're different. Like you know, Dennis Prager would. Would, would argue or something like that. Like, no, these things are actually related. So you very much see this in the, the Barry Weiss, Douglas Murray, the IDW types. Yeah. Yeah. I just see them as infiltrators to keep basically conserve liberalism, conserve yes. progressivism. Yeah. 100%. All right. However, Gottfried identifies the root of this not in managerialism per se, which is simply the vehicle through which it end, its ends are achieved, but in two proximate causes. Multiculturalism, which is to say the prevalence of minority groups whose political efforts go towards neutralizing the culture and institutional particularities associated with a majority outgroup, and a religious and cultural phenomenon owing itself chiefly to a progressive perversion of mainline Protestant churches that manifests itself as white guilt. David French was the first. Yeah. <laughs> concrete example of this. This is actually what got Sam Francis in trouble uh, mm -hmm. in the nineties. Uh, he wrote a column in the Washington times um, and he was, he was basically mocking uh, this Southern Baptist church for, for apologizing for slavery. 
uh, basically this this idea that that Christians today, you know, in the '90s, have any kind of responsibility for for something like slavery, right? And and also the idea of of kind of like uh, permanent group guilt. It, it seems to completely contradict the idea of of um, for for you know forgiveness of, of forgiveness in this Christian sense that that we can be absolved of our sins. Uh, instead, what we're saying is is that actually entire races of people have this kind of permanent original sin that um, that will not only taint them but also like every subsequent generation of white people carries this sin. And and um, San Francis just argued like this is absurd. It, it also seems to violate like Christian ethics and history. Uh, and that column actually got him in trouble. Um, he was right, of course, like everything he said in that column is correct. But it was just seen as, of course, it was it was construed as a um, an apology for slavery, which is which obviously that's not what it was. Uh, but the 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 funny thing is, is that that was considered a hot take at the time, so hot that it, you know, like I said, it got him in trouble, um, and it contributed to his firing from the Washington Times. But today, we there's like a unanimous agreement on the right, even like the mainstream right, that that yeah, this actually seems to be a kind of bizarre. Uh, Christian deformation, uh, the, the politics of white guilt. Like that is a totally mainstream view now, whereas it got a prominent intellectual uh, who who was talking about this in the 90s, it, it got him in trouble and ultimately contributed to him getting fired. So, Yeah, yeah. Dinesh D'Souza. That's right. All right. <laughs> this results in an atmosphere to which white people must submit in self-abasement and atonement for past sins. It necessitates the grafting onto administrative states of therapeutic and punitive agencies for forming social consciousness and chastising those with defective sensibility. That is a quote and a half right there. By now, political correctness and its causes are well-worn themes. It has also become a common. It has also become a common. It has also become commonplace to identify modern social justice and its dominant theme of white guilt as a kind of religion. Godfrey arrived at such conclusions at least twenty years before most commentators, as did Sam Francis, whose work we have already explored. The specific causes are incidental to our purposes here, but it is worth listing them. Godfrey sees the issue as predominantly American arising from the so-called melting pot, and then exported to the rest of the Anglosphere from the mid-1960s onward, onwards, who came to imitate the crusade against discrimination then being waged across the Atlantic. In the American milieu, milieu the key groups are the so-called WASPs, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, who have allowed their mainline churches to stray very far from biblical teachings to general sermonizing about the dangers of bigotry and an alliance of minority groups, which include Jews, Irish, and Italian Catholics, and Blacks. Gottfried locates at the heart of the issue the feminization of Christianity, the fusion of a victim-centered feminism with the Protestant framework of sin and redemption. It is not difficult to see a perverted form of the Calvinist doctrine of absolute depravity in contemporary social justice rhetoric. I, I think recall- that, the, um, that, that thesis that basically uh, radical social justice, whatever you want to call it, um, that it was not a European import to the United States, that this is actually something that we, uh, by we, I mean the United States kind of conceived and then ultimately exported, that that also is is that's a controversial opinion, right? Like a lot of a lot of conservative um, punditry revolves around this idea that basically everything was fine, um, but then some you know like some German idealism or whatever or, or Marxism got imported, uh, and that ultimately brought us to where we are now. That, that basically it was the uh, import of foreign ideas, but. Paul seems to believe that actually there, uh, this tendency was already present in the United States, that there, there, or there's something here that made the ideas particularly uh, virulent and destructive. Um, and I mean, this goes against uh, like even even 
institutions like like the Claremont Institute, right? Um, they they take the view that that actually uh, our problems are mostly imported from German from German thinking and German German uh, uh, views of, of like the social sciences and stuff like that. Um, Paul is saying no, like this is actually a homegrown problem, and it's funny because you you recently had the French government uh, talk about this that that basically the uh, like woke ideology. Uh, is is coming from the United States to France, and that they view it as a kind of threat to the stability of the French regime because essentially it 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 threatens to uh, delegitimize the French government, the French state, uh, by by doing what it's doing in the United States, that which is saying that the entire you know French society is built on on racism, on the exploitation of of uh, of minority groups and and stuff like that. Uh, where uh, for for the United States it's more about slavery in France it's more about colonialism but the French government has said like this is on the one hand a threat an existential threat to French society and on the other hand an American import uh, I, and I think that point doesn't get enough attention um, because it's worth chewing on right like why is that like what is this my my mind goes to um, I think his name was uh, William Lloyd Garrison. The, the abolitionist who, who uh, burned the constitution uh, and, and kind of, I think he referred to it as like a, like a deal with the devil or something like that. And I, I think that you always had this kind of radical tendency um, that was, it seemed like it was, uh, there's always this kind of millenarian tendency in the United States, uh, not in the average American, but uh, there was always this kind of faction in the U S that had this kind of millenarian radical social justice uh, can't. And, and I think, uh, Paul is really the only person that's, I think, tried to explore this. So. Mm. All right. Going back to reading, uh, the author in the first, the author's uh, writing in the first person here. I recall being at an international conference in 2017 at which a, fa- a world famous feminist Renaissance scholar at Columbia, undoubtedly a wasp, spoke for almost half an hour in unmistakably religious terms about her shame at being white. In truth, I could not bear witness to this act of public penance and left the conference hall after 10 minutes. Godfrey did not solely lay blame on Protestantism gone awry. He also points to the political games played by minority groups. Godfrey, who is Jewish, notes the double standard, for example, of Jews who combine strong nationalist feelings for their own group and for Israel with the advocacy of open borders, alternative lifestyles, and extreme pluralism for their host countries. That's quoting Gottfried right there. Elsewhere, around the time he was writing Multiculturalism and the, and the Politics of Guilt, he noted the weaponization of social justice rhetoric by Jewish groups against, the chief political, against their chief political rivals, the white Christian right. Quoting Gottfried, but seeking out block alliances with blacks and other marginalized groups is thought to help American Jews in another more significant way. Like gays and feminists, blacks are valuable for those who perceive the white Christian right as their major enemy and as the prime source of American anti-Semitism. I would urge Professor Foreman to look at the Anti-Defamation League's 1994 publication, the Religious Right, the Assault on Tolerance and Pluralism in America, as an illustration of how leading American Jewish organizations perceive their self-interest. It is by declaring solidarity with blacks and others thought to be on the left against the predominantly Southern-based religious right. Racist, the- theocracy, Holocaust denier, and anti-abortion are becoming interchangeable terms in American Jewish tirades against the Christian right. Remaining firmly tied to blacks is therefore seen as necessary to preserve Jews against the real enemy, the one they fear and detest most, whether or not it poses a real threat to their individual or communal existence. I think um, Paul's um, Paul has said elsewhere, I think, that he, he thinks that this, this strategy backfires, um, that it, it actually... Um, increases i mean we're so past like balkanization but basically uh th- th- it, that's exactly what it does it, it actually increases um conflict uh between groups in the united states m- more than it resolves anything i mean uh but uh, i mean the 
I think Paul's like one of the few people that uh, has written about this subject and uh, is willing to kind of, you know, make these points. But anyways, yeah, I mean, this is this is like probably Paul's one of the most controversial things that he writes about uh, as only probably he could or um, would be willing to. I mean, yeah, it's it's this is um, it's, a, it's a difficult subject. So eh, he still gets called an anti-Semite anyway. So, yeah, I mean, he's. <laughs> Yeah, I think he had family that was killed by the Nazis too. I think, but it's just, uh, yeah. I mean, to his to his credit, he's even willing to discuss these things. So, yeah, it's part of be part of the therapeutic state right. when you're getting accused of things that are absurd. All right. However, Gottfried notes Gottfried notes that other minority groups have played these political games too, including Irish and Italian Catholics. Of course, good students of elite theory would not be surprised in the slightest that in a multicultural liberal democracy, tightly organized special interest groups should come to dominate the disorganized majority. This is Moscow's law. What troubles Gottfried most is the manufacturing of consent that we have seen discussed, that we have already discussed, has been pathologized and even medicalized. This is where I'm going to say, just stop and say that when some of us say, especially Oren McIntyre has really be, you know, says this a lot and has almost become famous for saying that these people are just not going to leave us alone. They're the, the people, the people who want to be left alone are always going to be defeated by the people who aren't going to leave us alone or have no intention of leaving us alone. So I think that this section right here, this is starting to talk about that where, um, Anyone who thinks that this leftist ideology is they're somehow going to over overcome it politically. No, that, that's why these people don't care about politics. That's why these people will raid the compounds of former presidents. That's why these people will push the mutilation of children. Yeah, I think this is actually the most uh, interesting part of of the chapter, the, the basically yeah. the clinicalization of, uh, of disagreement. Yeah. He suggests that since the 1960s, the behavior modification and social engineering programs of the managerial state have relent relentlessly fought against discrimination and promoted diversity using the lo looming image of the Nazis or the ghosts of slavery and the segregationist South as cudgels in a permanent slippery slope argument. He identifies three tactics that are routinely employed. First, the tendency of media and other opinion makers to stress that consensus has already been reached, for example, over immigration or multicultural programs. In the UK, the BBC would routinely engage in this form of gaslighting on its flagship debate show, Question Time. They would routinely present a panel with four pro-immigration voices against a lone anti-immigration voice. The studio crowd would cheer the pro-immigration voices and boo the anti-immigration voice. This serves to isolate the viewer at home watching the show who may be against immigration by creating the perception that their stance is held by a despised minority. In fact, from 1964 to 2017, over 65% of the British public opposed immigration according to the British election study. The media nakedly employs a persuasion tool known as social proof in a bid to make the public more accepting of mass immigration. I mean, you wrote on you wrote on this uh, on, on yeah. immigration. I mean, yeah, I think um, the the point about social proof reminds me of something else that I've written about, which is called well, it's it's this idea of like socially constructed um, phenomena. It's like mass shootings, right? Um, there's this idea that is uh, constructed by the media that basically like there, there are um, that all mass shooters are white, right? That they're all this, this implicitly right wing uh, white person. Um, but obviously that's not true. Like the, the high profile things that we see on TV, like, you know, they, they happen to be these, uh, these like white schizophrenics or whatever, but they make up a minority uh, of, of the total population that is responsible for mass shootings. And uh, the study that I was citing to make this case actually argues that on the one hand, you, you have this, this thing, uh, the, the socially constructed perceptions of, of uh, social problems. Um, 
And on the other hand, it, it actually results in a kind of like misdirection of resources um, that because we're, we're, because our attention is focused on, you know, what seems to be this, this boogeyman of like, you know, the white um, mass shooter, our attention and efforts are directed toward essentially like, you know, increasing our, our like anti-discrimination regime, like the social engineering to, to stamp out like supposed, you know, um, white extremism, uh, white rage, as General Mark Milley uh, calls it, right? Um, but it, it's a complete waste in the sense that it doesn't, it doesn't actually solve anything. Uh, it, it basically creates a problem uh, that doesn't really exist and then pours resources and, and energy into addressing that. And ultimately, all it really does is kind of expand the size and scope of the managerial regime. Uh, you, you have a more invasive state that needs to root out, you know, the causes that supposedly contribute to this problem uh, of, of the white mass shooter, right? Um, and there, there, I mean, you, you could argue, and I, like I actually believe in this, that there's actually something that's driving people insane about modernity and making them commit these kinds of shootings. Uh, but it's not uh, like white racial resentment or something like that. Like, I think it's, I think it's actually much worse than that. Uh, it's something about the way that, the way that we live period today makes people, I think, nihilistic, but that's much harder to solve than, you know, the, the supposed boogeyman of, of like, of white extremism. That's, that's much more serious. You're talking about something that is like baked into the cake of the modern West. Uh, and you can't really, you can't really solve that. Like, there's no think tank that can address that problem, right? Uh, but these socially constructed narratives, like this social proof, I think, is an example of that. Uh, completely divert our attention and resources to things that are that ultimately serve no one except for the managers. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I thought you were going to start talking about industrial society and its future right there for a second. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> All right, let's move on. The second tactic Gottfried identifies is employing the past as a club. By harping on the real or imagined evils of the past, proponents of state-controlled socialization appeal to the guilty conscience of their listeners and furnish occasions for exhibitions of public righteousness. Such exhibitions have become by now so routine and widespread that they have gained the label virtue signaling. Who hasn't seen somebody post on social media that they're opposed to slavery? In, right. Yeah. In, in 2022. Thank you for, yeah. Just, yeah. It's just, thank you for, you know, letting us know that you're against slavery. That's great. It's, it, it's very brave, very yes. brave and stunning. Yes. Right. However, the third and most insidious method is to treat the unwanted behavior as a form of sickness to depict unfashionable thinkers and retrograde views as pathological. Gottfried is rightly perturbed at the implications of treating dissent as a form of mental illness, which requires psychiatric remedy. The pathologizing tendency has its overt post-war roots in the work of the Frankfurt School, and specifically Theodore W. w. Adrano's The Authoritarian Personality Type. Gottfried gives a full treatment to this text in his early book, After Liberalism, to which Multiculturalism and the Politics of Guilt was a sequel. Elsewhere, he is at pains to point out that contrary to certain right-wing conspiracy theories, which suggest the injection of Frankfurt School thinking into Western institutions as a Marxist plot hatched from Moscow, that Adorno was sponsored by an emphatically liberal but also anti-Soviet sponsor, the American Jewish Committee. In other words, this is not subversion by liberal, of liberalism by com communist agitators. This is the logic of, mon of managerial liberalism played out to its natural limits. Got anything to say about that? <laughs> no, I think that's, I think, um, again, it gets to this, this idea that, um, that these are imported, um, ideas right uh that yeah. no actually this this actually seems to be something that is is homegrown uh and i mean i think managerialism managerial liberalism is a, a, a good term to sum this stuff up um mm -hmm. 
but I, I think the the next part is what I was I, like I said this is this is the part that I think is really really fascinating and I, I wanted to talk about so let's do it in after liberalism drawing on Thomas Zaz it's Thomas Zaz right I think so Okay. And Christopher Lash, he charts how the fields of psychiatry and psychology gave rise to a new expert class whose role was to regulate, alter, and normalize behavior to conform to the requirements of managerialism. Quoting, the invasion of government and the courts by behavioral scientists has produced what Thomas Zaz calls the therapeutic state. Psychiatrists and social psychologists have been given social status, according to Zaz, and their moral and political judgments, though not always founded on hard empirical science, are taken to be expert. These experts today can affect decisions about the responsibility of criminals, the right to control property, and the custody of children. Psychiatric theologians have been able to impose their private political opinions as scientific truth, and Zaz cites the fact that the American Psychiatric Association now defines the involuntary treatment and incarceration of mental patients as health, health rights. Zaz also observes, if people believe the health values justify coercion, but that moral and political do not, those who wish to coerce others will tend to enlarge the category of health values at the expense of moral values. Health values have also become socialized through a global managerial culture. Since 1976, the United Nations, through its, imperi- in, through its International Covenant on Economic, Cultural, and Social Rights, has elevated the enjoyment of the highest standard of mental health to a sacred entitlement. Henceforth, henceforth, governments must ensure a sound state of mind as a human right. Yeah. No, I, I think this this whole thing um, is so important, and I think the most obvious example of, of this idea of psychiatric theologians is today is transgenderism. Um, and I don't think we really appreciate this point enough. Uh, there was a case recently in Arkansas where a uh, a judge ruled that Arkansas cannot enforce a ban on uh, gender transition therapy for for kids, uh, and obviously the, the justification for that is that basically the, these medical interventions, so the so called medical interventions, are life saving, and uh, we're going to get into Foucault here in a sec, and I actually think you're better off reading like Foucault at this point than John Locke in order to understand like the, the modern manager regime that, that basically uh, these claims that like gender transition therapy are, are life-saving and therefore necessary. And you can't stop. You can't, you can't even like through the, through the legislative process, it's, it's, it's not okay to prevent kids from getting access to this stuff. It's delivered in the, like the, the neutral language of science which gives this facade of exactly that. This is just objective truth. This is what the what the uh, the the academic institutions of medicine have decided is simply true. It's not political at all, but obviously it is. Every institution is political. It, it's a it's absurd to think anything else. But that is precisely why this stuff is so pernicious. That you have courts and social workers and all of these people that have the power to deprive you of your children, of your property, or even your freedom, who are grounding um, their their arguments in what what are supposedly kind of objective ethical concepts, uh, like best practices for care and things like that. It's extremely pernicious. And again, Paul's one of the few people that um, that, that talks about this. It's It's so dangerous and it's so scary. I mean, these people, they can pick you up and there's nothing you can do. They can do anything to you that they want to force Medicaid. I mean, <laughs> there was there was a time I was reading about somebody, somebody I've talked about in this podcast before, who actually committed suicide because he was in fear that they were going to lobotomize him. Oh, wow. You yeah. know, so, yeah. So, all right. It is interesting. It is interesting that this analysis of relationship between the field of mental health and power has a parallel on the left in the work of Michel Foucault. 
Foucault pointed out how the medical or clinical gaze obscures the functioning of power because of the morally neutral language of science. However, as much as Foucault is added to university reading lists and read by undergraduates, it seems that no one at universities, least of all those on the left, ever stops to question the relationship between power and pub and public and mental health in the current paradigm. One might suggest that this is because they now see themselves in power. Instead of using Foucault to criticize the current paradigm, they seem to remain frozen forever analyzing the culture of the 1950s and deconstructing the last one. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's the, that's the irony of, of, um, of, I guess, modern political scientists who are kind of bathed in... Uh, Foucaultian concepts, but don't really seem to apply them to uh, the existing paradigm and existing power structures, right? They continue applying them to the past. And the past always provides a justification for kind of uh, reshaping the future. Um, I, I Like I said, I, I actually think at this point you would get more um, understanding. It's probably more constructive to read people like Foucault at this point in order to understand like the the problems and, and how power works in in the world that you know uh, people like Foucault made, then you know reading like Locke uh, and and kind of pretending that we still live in in this like you know nineteenth century liberal constitutional republic or something like that. I think uh, I think Foucault was himself a, like a sexual deviant and a, a terrible human being, but his insights on power are actually. Um, are really useful. And I think that for Foucault, he was writing as someone who viewed himself as kind of out of power, right? And so when you're someone who views themselves as part of the, of, a, of a marginalized community, because Foucault was, he was gay and, uh, but not, not just that, like he was part of this uh, French uh, group of, ac- of intellectuals that signed a, a petition for abolishing age of consent laws in France. Like the, the guy was messed up, um, but as an outsider who who kind of sees all of these um, these taboos and taboos exist for a reason, but all of these kind of th- these things that um, make people behave and think and act a certain way uh, as as basically kind of constraints on your own individualism, uh, then you're going to want to figure out how these th- how these power structures work and how to dismantle them, and. For someone who is, you know, on the outside, that makes sense, right? Um, but I think the reason Foucault is useful to the right right now is that we're the ones that are on the. It's kind of it's a it's a paradox, right? Mm. Uh, the right, which is for so long identified with like institutions like the military and law enforcement and stuff like that, we're on the outside. We have no control over institutions anymore. The institutions are not conservative. They're not right wing. You are in the. You are basically in the shoes that people like Foucault were in, and that's why it actually behooves you to, to understand how the regime actually works, rather than how we've been told it does, uh, or how we would wish it uh, it did work. So I, I mean that that's my, that's my, uh, my position on, you know, why actually you should read Foucault. So. Yeah, and Foucault wrote books on prisons, wrote books on um, medicine, what where med how medicine was being handled in, yeah. in the modern time. I mean, there, there, <laughs> we know he was a deviant. A lot of that work though is, is spot on, especially for, especially in, um, in light of today. Okay. So, all right. Yeah. We are quoting Gottfried here. Christopher Lash explains the process by which the therapeutic segment of the managerial elite won moral acceptance. Despite the fact that it claims to be providing mental health, we're always mental health. We're always self-serving and highly subjective. The therapeutic class offered ethical leadership in the absence of shared principles. By defining emotional well-being as both a social good and the overcoming of what is individually and collectively dangerous, the behavioral scientists have been able to impose their absolutes upon a culturally fluid society. In The True and Only Heaven, Lash explores the implications for post-war politics of the authoritarian personality. A chief contributor to this anthology, Theodore Adorno, 
abandon his earlier work as a cultural cl- critic to become a proponent of governmentally imposed social therapy. According to Lash, Adorno condemns undesirable political attitudes as prejudice, and by defining prejudice as a social disease, substituted a medical for a political idiom. In the end, Adorno and his colleagues relegated a broad range of controversial issues to the clinic, to scientific study as opposed to philosophical and political debate. Yeah, I think this is um, another aspect of this particular section of the chapter that I think is really, uh, really important, really fascinating, um, that dis- dissent, disagreement is no longer merely a difference in opinions. It's it's pathologized. It's indicative, actually, of a social disease. Uh, I, I think that's, that's, you really saw this play out with like the arms, armchair psychology that people performed on Trump while he was in office, right? Like, uh, and these like popular psychology magazines, people writing about, you know, what, what makes Trump tick? And it's always something like fascism, right? Uh, or what makes his, his base tick, which is always something like fascism. Uh, it, it always seems to come back to that. Um, but the, the point is, is that these people literally don't accept um, viewpoints that, are, that, that they don't hold. It, it, it just can't be that way. It has to be indicative of some kind of pathology, right? If you don't like uh, like transgender activism or like LGBT activism, it's probably because you're closeted, right? Uh, if you don't like feminism, it's it's because you hate women. Uh, it, it's like there's if, if you don't like if if you think that we should have borders and immigration restriction, it's because you hate immigrants and brown people. Uh, like it, it's always it always actually has to be just a kind of surface level a symptom of some deep seated patho- some sickness that needs to be cured by therapy and social engineering. Uh, and what's important about that is that I, I, it means that they're never just going to accept uh, differing views. And I think that somehow this is connected also to our, our foreign policy, this idea that, uh, that there's only, if there's only one set of acceptable uh, political views and social views, then it follows that there's probably going, only going to be one acceptable form of government, right? And all other governments that are not that are existential threats uh, to you, and they have to be reconstructed. And like, and you see this in, in the, like the rhetoric of like neoconservatives on foreign policy. Uh, every 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 uh, geopolitical thing today is always like a contest between autocracy and liberal democracy, right? It, uh, we, we literally can't leave countries alone that, that our foreign policy establishment does not see as liberal democracies. Why? Because, because it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable that there could be another form of government, another, uh, another consensus, in other words, on governing. It, it's just not acceptable. And I, the same thing obviously applies to, to domestic politics. Yep. Well, it's one of the reasons why when the troops are leaving Afghanistan, you see pictures coming out and reports of George Floyd murals in in Afghanistan and that schools were teaching gender studies in Afghanistan. They have to export that to um they have to export that there. Yeah. And it, it's it, it's a religion. It's it's very evangelical in nature. All right, we had some technical difficulties there, but I'm just going to pick up right where we left off. Let me reshare this. And boom, we're moving on. As per Carl Schmidt, there are no neutral institutions, including medical and psychiatric institutions. If the managerial state makes anti discrimination, the morals of its political formula, then discriminatory views are diagnosed as mentally abnormal. In such a regime, unconscious bias training is mandated at most workplaces and for employees of the state, despite empirical proof that it does not even achieve the behavior modification at which it aims by admission of the British government. The UK Cabinet Office's written statement on unconscious bias training, ostensibly written in the neutral language of science, 
concludes by reaffirming its commitment to the political formula of the therapeutic state, equality, diversity, and inclusion. The civil service will therefore integrate principles for inclusion and diversity into mainstream core training and leadership modules in a manner which facilitates positive behavior change. Here is an open declaration that the state is engaged in positive behavior change as a central mission. At the time of writing, the former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair, speaking in an interview with CNN, said, it's an indicator of how broken politics has been that the issue of vaccination has bec- should become political. I mean, it's just a question of science. One might ask Mr. Blair how the issue of having one's body penetrated by a foreign object by order of the government could ever not be political. <clears throat> this uh, Paul talks about this in After Liberalism, that that basically like the um, the the clinicalization of everything, that in the early and mid 20th, say the, the mid 20th century, um, you have, um, and my, 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 I'm not actually not even going to give a, a timeline for this stuff because it's, I haven't, uh, I haven't absorbed it enough, but basically what, what Paul argues in general is that, uh, psychiatry arose initially in the United States as something that was used to address things like alcoholism. And, and domestic violence, right? So in other words, Paul suggests that, okay, in the beginning, this stuff might, you know, probably did have some merit uh, in, in kind of correcting deviant behavior. But then something happened and progressives, the, the progressive movement in the United States and its adherents basically started to view uh, things like psychiatry, not as correctives, not as a, a kind of a, something that we use to treat people who are behaving in a way that's bad, you know, like an alcoholic or something. Um, instead, we can actually use it to, to socially engineer society a certain way. In other words, to foster a certain kind of, of populace or citizenry that actually, I mean, we say citizenry, but really you're, you're talking more about like subjects, right? And I think uh, it reminds me of this, um, this idea that, that uh, Michel Foucault had, that, that basically in the 17th century, you had this, this kind of this emerging new type of power that he called uh, biopower. That that basically the moment that rulers, the moment that sovereigns uh, took it upon themselves to kind of concern themselves with the the um, the welfare of the population through through things like not just you know obvious things like um, like medical services and things like that and public services, but also th- even, th- I mean, like, I think Foucault even includes like census keeping, kind of like the moment that we started to put people on Excel spreadsheets, uh, or whatever the 17th century equivalent of that is, right? Uh, and then obviously onward from that, the moment that we started to do that, something happened where regimes began to concern themselves with with fostering a kind of way of life. That, that power before that was what Foucault called subtractive. So power before that, the way that you experienced it was the regime would take things away from you. It would take your life away from you. It would take your freedom away from you. It would take your your uh, your property away. It still does those things, obviously, right? But then this new type of power, biopower, starts to it's a it's a it's a kind of prescri- uh, prescriptive power that the regime is uh, that regimes going forward started to cultivate uh, ways of living, and. I think this is this is a really fascinating concept, and I think it's something that the right doesn't think about enough. Uh, th- this whole idea of social engineering, um, I, I think we do and we don't. But I mean, I think Paul's treatment—I'm kind of I'm butchering it right now—but Paul's treatment in after liberalism is—it's um, really incredible because I mean, even I think you even you you see the effects of these things in the way that conservatives have conversations where they make distinctions between like sex and gender without realizing that all of this stuff, even, even the words that we use, uh, it all arri- it, it all derives from these institutions that have been totally captured and turned against us to the extent that we don't, we don't even realize that we're still kind of operating within the language that these people have created in their paradigms. When, when we're trying to refute like leftists or something like that about how like, you know, sex is real and biologically grounded or something like that, uh, 
we still will use words and concepts that are developed by these people. I don't know if that made sense, but you know. just conservatives are conserving uh, conserving liberalism and, <laughs> and progressivism. It's worse than that, I think, actually. But yeah, yeah. correct. But, but s simply for somebody who you know d doesn't really follow and read a lot of what we um, you know, a lot of what we do is basically there it makes its way in it makes its way into everything it insinuates its yeah. way even into your thinking yeah and i think even in this idea of like um like it, it's just science right it's a question of science i mean even that um a, a great it's funny i was thinking about this the other day it, it, ask someone what is recidivism so ask someone who's like pro criminal justice reform you know pro defund the police or whatever and ask them what's uh because obviously they'll they'll tell you that like you know recidivism programs work these programs where we're like you know dangerous criminals can rehabilitate themselves by like washing dogs in prison and stuff like that um that, that it works and so you just ask them a simple question because they're so certain that recidivism has been reduced right so you ask them like what is recidivism and they'll tell you well the likelihood of someone to reoffend once they get out of prison uh but that's not true in Ohio, recidivism is not that straightforward. Like if you get out of a prison in, you know, in a particular county and you go across the state, state line to like Michigan and you and you commit a crime there and you go back to prison, as far as the, the Ohio Corrections Department is concerned, you're not a recidivist because you committed that crime in Michigan. And I think that gets at this problem of like, well, it's science. It's, it's, it's empirical objective data. How could you argue with that? It's it's neutral in other words, but obviously nothing is neutral. Like your your uh, your truth claims that you think are founded on objective empirical fact are not because they they are laundered through institutions that are politicized, it, like every institution is. And so you, you actually, I mean, if you really think about this, you might even go crazy because what basically what you're saying is is that like the 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 foundation for truth uh, does not really stand on anything in in western liberal societies today except for basically just you know the the opinions of people who are insane and unfortunately also in power we will move on it is important for us to grasp here the salient features the salient feature of gottfried's analysis which is not merely to say that the managerial state has developed and adopted this ideology and those tools of mass manipulation to justify its own power, but also that it has developed them as a political a weapon. Quoting Gottfried, the political class has adopted inclusiveness as a political instrument, as a means of controlling a society it has set about reshaping. The diversity machine is a mechanism of state power that operates without anyone being permitted to notice its coercive nature. Therapeutic regimes are packaged in a way that disguises their resort to force. Both the left and establishment right in the United States, the states which misrepresent political life, have helped to make this concealment possible. Thus, insidious efforts at social engineering are shrouded in a closed of benevolence. In managerial doublespeak, flatly coercive programs are cast as vehicles for empowerment. One is reminded of when Bob Dylan sings, good intentions can be evil, both hands can be full of grease, you know that sometimes Satan comes as a man of peace. Every moral revolution expands the realm of managerial control. The government, now in place, searches out radical forces in order to break down non-inclusive behavioral patterns and to subjugate citizens. Those who favor such a course, for individual or collective reasons, will empower the state to pursue it. The most blatant example of this in recent years has been the borderline insane push to recognize transgender men and women as being indistinguishable from, so, from so-called cis men and women. Yeah, the go ahead. no, that's it. You can keep reading. I'll I'll comment after the J.K. Rowling thing. Okay, the public maintenance of obvious fictions and falsehoods signals allegiance and obedience to the regime, and serves no other function whatsoever than to punish dissidents. The most famous example of this has been the attempted unpersoning of the otherwise pristinely political correct, uh, politically correct liberal J.K. Rowling for her alleged transphobia. Yep. Controversy surround 
you want to yeah. do it now? Yeah, sure. Um, no, I think this is, I mean, this, this gets at kind of the point that we were discussing earlier where, I mean, I'm, and I've been guilty of this too, just kind of out of laziness, but um, it's kind of like the marriage thing, right? Like the moment that you start referring to marriage as traditional marriage to just to make a distinction between traditional marriage and, you know, non-traditional uh, marriage or, you know, gay marriage or whatever, um, you, you've already kind of lost because you've already had to make that, uh, that distinction and you've created a, a second category. And I, Patrick Deneen is actually very good at, at pointing this out when it comes to marriage, but, but it obviously it applies to much more. So the moment that you start saying cis women or cis men or even biological men and biological women, um, the moment that you do that, you've, you've kind of created, you've implied that there's a second category of woman and that these other people that occupy this category um, are not really women, uh, but, but maybe they are in, a, in one sense, you know what I'm saying? And I think that conservatives, I mean, and in a, in a much more absurd level, this, this applies to the idea that, um, you know, you have some of these so-called good liberals and some conservatives too, who oppose, you know, militantly transgenderism in kids, but are actually fine with the idea of transgenderism as a concept for, for consenting adults who understand the implications of what they're getting into. So they actually accept the most important uh, premises. And I, I think Rowling kind of falls, I mean, she does and she doesn't like she, you know, she, she's rejected the idea that, that, um, that men who mutilate themselves can become women and all that, but Rowling accepts a lot of other premises that kind of made this whole thing inevitable. And in my view, a lot of this stuff derives from feminism. The, the uh, idea that we should essentially uh, destroy distinctions between men and women, it, it's kind of coming back to um, bite people like rolling. But anyways, yeah, I think the, the language thing is, is important. And that's, that's the part that caught uh, my eye about this, this section, the whole you know, cis men or cis, uh, biological men, stuff like that. Definitely seeding ground. Controversy surrounding her failure to abide by the new managerial edict to recognize biological men who take hormone supplements and wear skirts as women and biological women who take testosterone supp supplements and wear masculine clothing as men has led to, among other things, a school dropping her name from a building and her vir virtual erasure from a 20-year Harry Potter reunion. In 2000. In 2002, Gottfried predicted, correctly as it turned out, that the ever-widening chasm between the equality, diversity, and inclusion doctrine of the therapeutic state and the lived reality and beliefs of most ordinary people would result in a populist backlash against managerial overreach. He claimed that the regime faces a paradigm crisis in which the gap between its democratic and liberal self-descriptions and its imposed social policies would become too obvious to escape notice, and therefore the efforts to justify these policies with archaic terminology or human rights rhetoric no longer elicit widespread belief. At the time of writing, a recent study by the University of Chicago has found that 47 million Americans are said to believe that the 2020 election was stolen. 21 million believe that Joe Biden is not a legitimate president. 63% of people agree with the statement that African American people or Hispanic people in our country will eventually have more rights than whites, a belief sometimes called the Great Replacement, and 54% agree that a secret group of Satan-worshipping pedophiles is ruling the U.S. government, which is the key belief in the QAnon movement. A more recent poll has found that one in three Americans believe that violence against the government is violent. Moscow's warning that no ruling class can remain a ruling class for as long as for for long if the masses do not buy into its political formula seems to ring ever louder. Yeah, I think I mean you see this playing out in all these warnings that um, there there are two articles that stand out that that recently were published, and I think one was in the Associated Press. But it's like you know more people than ever before are living in their own reality. Um, or uh, basically that faith or, uh, yeah, I guess faith in American institutions is plummeting. Um, institutions that are responsible for like creating consensus, right? And um, 
I don't know. Um, I, I think I generally want to agree with Moscow that that basically ruling classes historically have required people to buy into their political formula in order for them to stay in power. But uh, th something about the our contemporary problems seem difficult. Um, it might have just something to do with like the level of comfort the average person enjoys. You know, like as angry as your um, like your boomer Republican gets about what Biden is doing. Um, not not just boomers. This is not just like a boomer problem, but like you take someone who's like super super angry about what Biden is doing, uh, and um, they they still will participate in things that contribute to all these problems that they think are ruining society. And I think the most obvious example of this is probably like like uh, sports, right? Like watching professional sports. Um, th like there are so many conservatives who are addicted to to watching professional sports obsessively, knowing that their money and their attention and their emotions are being invested in something that is uh, totally opposed to the things they claim to hold dear. You know, like like pretty much every sports institution is like that, uh, supporting BLM, supporting transgenders and stuff like that. Like in, in every time that you like buy a jersey or watch a game or something like that, you're supporting those things. Even though you don't agree with the political formula, right? You, you you reject the political formula when it's presented to you, but then you continue doing things that actually support um, the system uh, to which the political formula is part. And I think that that is, I mean, I, we've always had bread and circuses, right? That's that's nothing new, but there, something seems uniquely bad about contemporary bread and circuses in our ability to, uh, or in, uh, in its ability to, to make this whole thing possible, that people can be simultaneously, you know, angrier than they've ever been since the Civil War, but still seemingly incapable to to really do anything constructive with that anger. Um, yeah, so I think it, it's it's a unique problem. I think, like I said, I agree with Moscow, but I also think that there's there's like a, something new has been added to the mix that makes all of this worse. There is a uh, an article came out today from our friends over at National Review, um, showing that 20 teams in the MLB, Major League Baseball, are donating up to six figures and some into six figures for youth gender, youth gender transitioning. Yes. It's, it's weird to me that people are like, wow, this is outrageous. It's like, yeah, this. why, why are you surprised? It's outrageous that you're surprised by this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on. Where Francis took his cues chiefly from Burnham and Pareto, Gottfried's chief influence was Carl Schmitt, and in particular, the primacy of the political. The idea that we could ever reach the end of history has been shown to be nonsense. But Gottfried stresses that a peculiar feature of therapeutic managerialism is its need to maintain the fiction of consensus. Previous ruling classes had no such requirement and had more actual diversity of opinion within their ranks. However, to function properly, the therapeutic state requires the downplaying of genuine political differences. The sorts of characters who attend the Davos agenda hosted by the World Economic Forum, the most elite managers of today, speak in the language of consensus. One such character, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, who manages over $7.5 trillion in assets and who can name the U.S. Federal Reserve as a client, uses phrases such as public-private partnership and, and stresses that it is important for CEOs across all business to be unified. It has never been more essential for CEOs to have a consistent voice. Although he speaks in terms about the power of capitalism, it is quickly clear that Fink's message is managerial and that his vision for a quasi-command economy in which the controllers of capital dictate the investment agenda for, for the future. Quoting, every company and every industry will be transformed by the transition to a net zero world. The question is, will you lead or will you be led? We focus on sustainability not because we're environmentalists, but because we are capitalists and fiduciaries to our clients. 
divesting from entire sectors, or simply passing carbon-intensive assets from public markets to private markets will not get the world to net zero. When we harness the power of both the public and private sectors, we can achieve truly incredible things. This is what we must do to get to net zero. Yeah, yeah I like um, I, I, I'm Probably one of the best things about this book is is the fact that it really drives home this point that uh, this this idea that you're still living in the world of like 19th century laissez-faire capitalism is just absurd, you know. And and it's funny because like you still hear this on the uh, like on the so-called dissident right. Like you'll still hear people kind of be critical of the um, I guess you could say the anti-capitalist rhetoric from people like myself, right? Like they're basically there's this concern that maybe we're going too far with, with you know, uh, going after uh, corporations and things like that. But it's like, no, we're actually not going far enough. Uh, and, and when people like Larry Fink are telling you uh, that we need to kind of have this, this increased partnership between public and private sector, or this not, the partnership is there. He's just saying that we need to mobilize together. Um, the, the so-called capitalists were telling you that they're not really capitalists. You know, like, I don't know why we're, we're arguing about this. Uh, and I think obviously the, the more correct term is managerialism. That's the kind of economy that we live under. So I, I don't know. I think um, liberals complain that we live under capitalist society. Uh, conservatives claim that we live under socialism or something or communism. It's like it, no, it, it's actually, a, it's a fusion of both of those things. It's called managerialism. Yep. Yep. Simply put, this is not capitalism. This is agenda setting whereby one of the most powerful executives in the world announces five-year and 10-year plans for what the future will look like in an almost entirely top-down managed economy. The language of consensus conceals the truly political character of what Fink is saying. In fact, he has the temerity to start his letter by saying that COVID, quoting Fink now, COVID-19 has also deepened the erosion of trust in traditional institutions and exacerbated polarization in many Western societies. This polarization presents a host of new challenges for CEOs. Political activists or the media may politicize things your company does. They may hijack your brand to advance their own agendas. In this environment, facts themselves are frequently in dispute. But business have but businesses have an opportunity to lead. <laughs> Thus, when he sets his net zero carbon agenda later, it is cast in the politically neutral language of inevitability. But in actuality, his letter contains an explicit threat. If CEOs do not get on board with this agenda, they will be left behind. They will be identified as the enemies of progress and someone perhaps someone whose company owns half the exchange-traded funds in the world, might see to it that these enemies no longer have a seat at the table. In theory, the market decides, but in practice, men like Larry Fink decide. A company can now be sunk regardless of its actual success with consumers simply through investor activism. Likewise, Products that have little to no market demand, such as Beyond Meat, can be thrust onto the shelves despite continually failing to sell. Appalling sales figures have not stopped massive corporations such as McDonald's and KFC pushing Beyond Meat plant burgers to the front and center of their menus using the full might of their advertising budgets. Yeah, yeah, I think this is gets to another important point, which is the idea that go woke, go broke is a thing. It's not, it's a myth. It's a, it's a cope again, that conservatives, I keep hammering conservatives because that's, it's, that's like my audience, right? I'm trying to mm -hmm. tell these people that you mean well, but it's wrong. Um, the, yeah, that if, if places go woke, you know, no one's going to want to buy your stuff. Correct. No one is going to want to buy, you know, or actually in time they will. Uh, I mean, that's just how this stuff works. Um, like you've got uh, celebrities on the left and right and in the middle that are promoting this kind of stuff, like Beyond Meat. Um, I don't know wh where you would put Vitalik, uh, the, the Ethereum guy on the spectrum, but you know, he tweeted a picture of himself eating um, their protein bites made out of crickets. And 
So like that, like the, the, uh, in, unfortunately, at some point in the future, I'd like this stuff is going to be pushed on more and more people, uh, regardless of the cost, because they believe in it. Um, I think you can't discount that the 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 power of, of belief. Uh, and I always try to make it a point to say like, look, there are, there are two people in the world: cynics and ideologues. Cynics do it for the money; ideologues do it because they really believe it. And oftentimes. They work together because what they what they want to do in the direction they want to go overlaps, um, and I think the the ideology part helps to explain why uh, go woke go broke just doesn't work. Like they are willing to lose this money. There, there's this quote. I think it was I read it in Breitbart. I don't know where it's originally from, but it was um, some market some marketing bigwig from Nike who was who was talking about the losses that Nike had posted. After Nike went woke and you know made Colin Kaepernick, Colin Kaepernick its poster boy, and this marketing guy just said, um, "Well, we're not worried about it because we don't think that you know the future of Nike is uh, old white guys, uh, old angry white guys." And so ba basically, they're willing to lose millions of dollars because they think in the long run they're going to win uh, because they believe in this stuff. And I mean, yeah. So I, I think. Uh, it's important to basically get that out of your head. Like you, the cavalry is not going to come. Like no one's, the market is not going to save you. The invisible hand is not going to come down and crush beyond me. Like it's just not going to happen. You have to do things that you have to figure out how to do these things yourself. And there is the chance that if a, people start abandoning Nike left and right and go to New Balance, maybe a Larry Fink and, or some of his friends decide to wage war on New Balance, yeah, that's right. New Balance, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, capitalism, yeah. Well, that's that's what we have. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. All right. Most of this attempted engineering of consent by the therapeutic regime serves the purpose of identifying Schmidtian friends and enemies. The list of enemy terms which serve to expel you from employment and society at large continues to expand. Sexist, racist, homophobe, transphobe, client denier, unvaccinated, and so on. These are all markers of ideological impurity which serve to dehumanize. Ideologically conscripted armies tended more and more to demonize their targets. Those who resisted the ideal embodied by one's nation were no longer viewed as human in, think in thinking or in fact. In the 20th century, it resulted in catastrophic total wars between managerial states. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the USA, under the neoconservatives, continued a crusade to spread liberal democracy to all parts of the world and to dissolve any vestiges of outmoded tradition with a missionary zeal. As these efforts were frustrated, and as populations ever more started to turn against such warmongering, the missionary zeal turned inwards. Where in the 1990s and 2000s, so many ersatz Hitler, Hitlers resided in Serbia, Iraq, Iran, North Korea, and so on. In the 2020s, they are at home. Not simply the despised Donald Trump, but also his supporters, and now people who refuse to submit to the prescribed remedies of the COVID-19 pandemic. In time, it will no doubt encompass meat eaters, people who wish to drive petrol-fueled cars, and so on. The question remains whether society can function while around 30% of the productive population are demonized and dehumanized in this way. This has never been achieved in history by any ruling class. Stalin and other such dictators simply opted to eliminate their enemies through brute force. They were willing to do so to consolidate power and control. Managerial elites seem unwilling to use such force and instead must rely on increasingly transparent games of perception management. At least by the estimation of Ngar Woods, speaker at the World Economic Forum in November 2021, our current ruling elite seem to be aware of their own unpopularity. At an event, at an event called the Great Narrative, she said, At Davos a few years ago, the Edelman survey showed us that the good news is the elite across the world trust each other more and more so we can come together and design and do beautiful things together. The bad news is that in every single country they were polling, the majority of people trusted the elite less. Of course they have to come together. They see the writing on the wall. Yeah. They, yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, again, it's it, importantly, uh, they're not deterred by it. 
they, like they're they're confident that ultimately they're going to win. Uh, they've got the resources, they've got the brains, um, and they're, they're not really experiencing any push. I mean, the only this is like the the thing that's difficult to discuss, especially in the United States today, is like the only people that are really kind of pushing back on these Western liberal eat the bug elites are countries like Russia and uh, maybe even China, right? Uh, and I, I think it it is a very strange position to be in. Um, and maybe I think this also contributes to the establishment's fear of figures like Donald Trump and obviously Viktor Orban, um, because they represent, I mean, setting aside like Russia and China, uh, guys like Orban and Trump represent the possibility of, of, of an alternative. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I mean, this, this is um, something that's been on my mind a lot because I, I had a conversation with my friend who's, who's German and, you know, he grew up his whole life hating Russia and uh, his, his family hates Russia to this day. And, and, um, and he just told me like, I, uh, he's not, like he's not a Russophile, and neither am I. But he, he basically just said, like, I can't help but think that that somehow, um, like, the the West is on the wrong side of of history here, unironically. And that's not to say that Russia is on the right side, but basically, like, it was like he was trying to understand why he felt like he had a stake in Russia not losing this war in Ukraine. And he'd yeah. be like, I mean, he was he was like tortured trying to explain this to me, right? Because it goes against everything he believes. But he's just saying, like, I feel like the same people that want to crush Russia are the ones that want to crush me. And I and he just it was really um, interesting this this talk that we had, and it, it's been on my mind a lot because again, this is someone who hates Russia. You know, he would never live there. He doesn't like Putin. Uh, he he like I said, he was raised hating Russia. But here he is saying, like, I feel like if they if they lose, somehow I do too. But he's also not rooting for Russia, obviously. I mean, it, this I think this is actually on a lot of people's minds. But obviously, it's just not something that you can openly discuss um, with most people because they just wouldn't understand it. Uh, but I think uh, there's a, a non-insignificant uh, part of the population that kind of feels this way. So... Yeah. Even myself, I'm I'm of the age where I grew up during the Cold War, and th that was our enemy. And now I'm looking, you know, now I'm looking, and I'm like, you know, I hear Putin give speeches, you know, decrying um, Stalinism, decrying Marxism, and decrying the West. And I'm like, all right, I'm not supposed to like this guy, but why he would. Basically, the way he talks about this regime, he would be one of the people that Paul talks about who is targeted if he lived here and he was American. Yeah, and I think you have to remember that at least initially, Trump had talked about normalizing relations with Russia. Yes. And that was a huge, that was, I think that was a huge factor in the establishment's hate for him. Um, because again, it, it represents the possibility of of a of a different uh, world order, right? A, a different political consensus, and um, yeah, I mean, again, this this is something that you simply don't really hear discussed in the West, um, or at least in the United States, because of the of the consensus uh, that's emerged on this. I mean, maybe in other places like Hungary, you'll you'll hear it more often, but I mean, yeah, I, I think uh, the uh, the, I mean, the consensus is like it's overpowering, at least from the from um, the institutions of elite opinion making. Right. But yeah, anyway, it's an interesting point. Yeah, we got one paragraph left here. The World Economic Forum's Global Risks Report for 2022 lists social cohesion as a major concern and notes that a recent poll in the United States, for example, found division in the country to be voters' top concern. They expected it to worsen in 2022. While Gottfried in 2002 was unwilling to predict their ultimate demise, it seems to me that unless the current ruling class is prepared to become openly coercive and use force, it will be overthrown once counter-elites become organized enough to do so in every region and locality. You want to 
what's your opinion on that? Because I mean, that's probably probably the most um, controversial. Is we're soon these people are going to be overthrown, and so many people just can't see it. Well, I don't, he doesn't say soon. Well, uh, yeah, I know he doesn't say. He soon. just says and it, it, it's it, it's also an if. Uh, it yeah. seems to me, which is a, is another way of saying if, yeah. if these, uh, if the current ruling class, you know, um, doesn't change its approach, it will be overthrown. So I think there's there's it's obviously contingent on right. certain things happening, right, and falling into alignment. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm not really at black pilled, so to speak. I I don't I don't think that it's I don't think that their victory is inevitable. I, I think that um, this is, I, I made a thread about this recently and I, I, it was well received, but I also got a lot of hate for it. And basically what I was saying is that the, um, the, the people who I think are, are actually radical, who are on the dissident right. And for me, the dissident right was like, I, you know, probably starting in 2016, started to kind of get introduced to, you know, like the radical right and um, like reading guys like Buchanan and, and Gottfried and San Francis. And so that was a dissident right for me, uh, ba basically like pal the paleoconservative authors, because they are, um, which, which is separate from like the online right. This this gets confusing really fast. But the point that I was making was that like basically the, the, the dissident right, the radical right has attained a kind of purchase in the mainstream. What I mean by that is that you have some people and institutions in the mainstream that are that have kind of like have buy-in to, to, to the ideas of the dissident right. Like you've got people who are totally mainstream basically saying the same things that only the dissident right was saying a few years ago, like immigration moratorium, dismantle the FBI, you know, basically like decapitate government leadership. I don't mean literally, I mean like mass firings and things like that. Um, which, you know, is something that like that, that that you're hearing about now, like Axios did that story about how the Trump administration is going to like fire a bunch of people and staff them with loyalists and stuff like that. Like the fact that these ideas are becoming mainstream means that like, the, like, uh, like I said, the, D, the DR has a kind of buy in on some level. And what the dissident right has done for a long time is is basically just kind of point out problems uh, and, and basically notice patterns and things like that, um, things that like no one else is willing to notice. And the, my thread was basically saying like, we can still continue doing those things and, and noting these problems, you know, like, like the Proud Boys were crushed by the feds, but Antifa, which is far more violent, you know, can openly do armed patrols in like red Texas. Like that, that that's a problem that no one is really talking about. So then, but the, the next thing that we have to do is actually figure out how to come up with actionable solutions to these things you know how how could states actually repress antifa and make it so these people cannot publicly organize you know how how could you um how could you prevent institutions from forcing or normalizing transgenderism in society uh and the like i i've been accused of being like a ron DeSantis shill i'm just but what, what, I, what I, the reason i talk about him and write about him so much is because i see a governor that's actually using power effectively so like threatening to revoke the beverage license of a place that serves alcohol where you have transgender uh, like strippers, you know, pr prancing around in front of little kids. It's like, okay, you want to do that? Okay, then we'll take away your beverage license and effectively destroy the business. Like, I think that's the kind of stuff that we should be thinking about and, and actually implementing, not just like writing, you know, based basically kind of statement legislation, which Republicans do this all the time. Like, here's my my draft of this piece of legislation that's never going to go anywhere for like term limits. Like, well, we don't actually have to play that game. Like we have governors, you know, we, we have people, we, we already have people in positions of power. And as we get more of them in positions of power, how can we actually do these things uh, in a way that is consistent with what Parvini is describing? And that, that's kind of what I'm, I'm really interested in focused in, in now is, is actually organizing and going beyond the pattern recognition, problem recognition part, uh, and then actually starting to implement um, solutions. You know, I, the other example that I use for DeSantis is his whole thing with Disney, just basically stripping them of their special tax privileges in Florida for 
taking the side of transgenderism uh, against the against the uh, not only what the governor wanted to do, but also what like normal people in Florida want, which is uh, you know g- getting transgenderism out of schools. So, yeah, no the um, one thing though that it, the right needs is they need to change their minds. They really have to start embracing the fact that there's power out there and they need to use it. Yeah. And, yeah. No, I, I agree. Yeah. Historically, it's just get in there. We'll tweak a little bit. And all they end up doing is basically continuing the regime. So yeah. um, there's um, a, a great example. Of this last thing I said, because you know, we're both running out of time, but the um, there's a guy named Mark Elias and he's like a Democrat election lawyer. And he's, he's really a kind of legal field marshal. This guy oversaw an army of lawyers that uh, was responsible for something like 200 pre-election lawsuits uh, that basically made it easier for Democrats to win in key states by removing restrictions on things like mail-in voting and absentee ballots. And so that was before the election, right? And like this is the other thing too for conservatives who understandably because they don't have power they kind of like they look towards like you know kind of incredible explanations for why things didn't go their way like dominion or something like that right like the like servers in germany and like shootouts in spain and stuff like that actually it's guys like mark elias who are secretly like waging lawfare and and like changing election uh laws in your states without you ever knowing about it right and then, so that was before the election and then after the election elias led an army of lawyers that successfully thwarted like 64 attempts by trump's legal team to investigate uh election irregularities we where is our mark elias on the right why don't we have someone like and, and like it's funny i've made this point to people who are conservatives and like well mark elias is a sleaze bag he's ruthless and I'm like, yeah, so where's my sleazebag, ruthless right winger, you know, yeah. who's, who's extremely competent? Uh, and, and I think that's and it's funny because no one, although the initial reaction from people is always kind of like, oh, that guy's a dirtbag. Once I explain like, yeah, and but he's effective. No one has disagreed with me. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, actually, we do need people like Mark Elias, these people who are just totally ruthless, you know, stone cold killers. Just being being content with having a seat at the table that just has to go out the window. I mean, it's, I mean, it, ugh, I can't even no anymore. Um, plug what you want to plug and we'll end this. I know we gotta, we gotta go. Yeah. Um, well you can, you can read my column theory of a partisan at chronicles magazine.org. And then I've got my Substack at contra.substack.com and my Twitter. At, actually I'm on Twitter, getter gab and other places uh, under the same handle. Uh, emeriticus e-m-e-r-i-t-i-c-u-s i think earlier i said psychiatry in the 19th century if i did that was a mistake uh paul and the the, the point about psychiatry is is in the 20th century uh with with the progressives so i just wanted to i, I was thinking about that and i was like no psychiatry wasn't a thing like <laughs> at the time yeah. but anyways. freud for freud early 20th century yeah that's right really all yeah, right appreciate it paul talks about that. yeah how are you yeah, yeah. all right Pedro, thanks